we are uh, with uh, Dan Martin Katz. Uh, Dan is a professor of law at uh, Chicago Kent's College of Law. So uh, Dan, you've worked a lot on uh, what is called predictive analytics or, or legal analytics. Um, and we would be really interested in, in knowing uh, on the basis of your work in which you, you have tried to predict the judgments of the Supreme Court in a rather successful way. What we would like to know really is what impacts do you uh, see in the industry? What specific applications, what advantages will this have uh, for lawyers, for instance, for judges? And uh, how long do you think it will take for these uh, solutions to be actually in the mainstream? Well, I think uh, uh, we've done some research that's public, and that's this prediction of the United States Supreme Court decisions. But um, think of that more as a proof of concept of the types of uh, approaches one can bring to bear on a lot of other problems. So through the company, we do predictions of a wide range of yeah. different um, tasks that lawyers are uh, uh, charged to undertake. So uh, say a company has been sued, the first question you have if you're a business leader is, yeah. what are we facing here? Are we, is this a major case, a minor case? Well, or should we you know, be gearing up for a, a battle? Or do you yeah. think this is gonna be something that we can, we can deal with? And so being able to try to, um, uh, so people will go to their lawyer to try to get that answer, but, yeah. but one, another place to maybe go or blend, with, blend that expertise with their lawyer is a, some sort of statistical or prediction model. Uh, right. So I think there's a bunch of clear business cases for predicting outcomes, uh, both of, judge, of lawsuits, but also we can talk about a few other things like contracts and uh, um, uh, diligence and uh, compliance uh, plans, probably as well. Yes, to yes. To, to, compliance, to, to, to compliance is a huge. Analyze the risks. Somebody in your organization, yeah. as we speak, is uh, doing something they shouldn't. Do, bad behavior. Yeah. Can you find it and stop it? Taxes, I guess, as well. Taxes, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think uh, um, there's a lot of. of concrete business cases that stem from this basic idea of being able to better forecast things. Right. So to what extent do you think the industry uh, has already incorporated this and, and how long do you think it will take for the typical large law firm to actually take this as a matter of course? Well, I think we're, we're still quite a ways from having it be, a, a, let's say, a mainstream idea. Yeah. Uh, I think there are pockets of some organizations and some sort of outside players who have been who have gotten good at this particular task I'd point to um, the insurance industry uh, with more traditional or garden variety cases has gone good on building actuarial models what we want to do is try to extend that idea to lots of other areas one other place you might look is litigation funding people have been involved in and either doing what we call explicit litigation funding or implicit litigation funding and that all stems from being able to forecast you can't yeah can't use financial tools or instruments if you can't predict what's going to happen with some level of precision. Yeah, yeah. So um, another question, because this, this opened up uh, another question very dear to us, which is about the, um, the, the skills, the knowledge that future lawyers, a few years from now, as you're describing, right. will have to have to master these technologies, to make the most of them, and even to advance them. So what is, do you think, the role of um, education institutions in trying to, uh, I wouldn't just say accelerate the innovation, but to, in a way, democratize innovation. What, what do you think the future um, lawyer needs to know and the skills it needs to have to really make the most of the uh, fantastic opportunities that these technologies are bringing? Well, I, I'll start specifically with analytics. I think the ability, at least for somebody in your organization, to have a better handle on how to use some of these models and methods is an imperative. Uh, I think if you say what is the value proposition of a lawyer, one of the tasks lawyers are asked to do is predict stuff, forecast stuff. And so to the extent that's being done by an, a single human expert, that's versus maybe that expert with an algorithm, maybe a group of those experts, it, that's a more sound way to do things. So I think um, you know, students who are, who are gaining skills, of course, would not have all the experience that a Long, uh, uh, um, a lawyer who's been practicing for many years, but they might be able to help an organization along these lines while they're building those skills. That's really on the analytics side. I would also say being uh, better on project management, process improvement, uh, better understanding kind of the business of law and business yeah. and accounting more generally, finance. I think that makes you a more complete knowledge worker 
in the 21st century. So I, my view is that uh, uh, I wrote a paper called the MIT School of Law, which sort of imagined these Very ideas and said, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what would an MIT School of Law look like? I think it would be world class, but it would look a little different than law schools have historically looked. Yeah, no, fully agree on that. That's very interesting. Um, let me just make it the final, the final question. Please. And um, I mean, as an academic, and I, I know you have a keen interest on using all these technologies to improve the legal system, broadly speaking. I think that's a critical Indeed. responsibility that we all share as, as academics, especially, but also the legal industry. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about this? Uh, maybe a few examples of how this is already happening, how AI is being used maybe in your own lab, yes. to uh, improve justice in any meaningful way? Well, I think one place is uh, uh, people have been very interested in is uh, legal services for the poor yep. and trying to help uh, uh, match lawyers with clients who are in need. That's one problem, and, uh, and that's, that matching problem is a pretty good task for algorithms. Uh, another thing is helping them uh, complete forms using technology, so instead of saying fill out a form, we say follow this, this set of questions, structured questions through a user experience. Yeah. Instead of having to do this very cumbersome form that looks very complex for them, yeah. try to make it a simple experience, as simple as using your iPhone or something like this that people have become comfortable with. So I think that there's real opportunities to have what we might call justice that's scalable to, to everybody in society, yeah. uh, but we really have to make take stock of things like the best in class technologies from other fields. Yeah. Which is, a, which is a, I think is a key question, is, is global in its dimension. Obviously yes. some, some countries is worse than in others. One yes. would imagine that in the, in the US you are far more advanced, although when you start going to the details, we know that there yes. are many millions which are underserved. Yes. But obviously when you go to We do a terrible that, job on yeah. the, for services for the poor. Our, our great hope is to try to do better for, the, yeah. for, the, for everybody else, let's say. So we, we, we hope where, uh, this is an area in which AI will actually uh, be used, be employed to improve the, 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 the future of those that are, have not been served by the system. Uh, Dan, thanks a lot for Thank that. Thank you very thanks much. For your